Well, it is right at 12. So we try to start these promptly. We will probably let some more folks uh, trickle in as we do a few housekeeping and introductions, but I am going to go ahead and let us get started. Uh, my name is Kate Snyder. I am the Associate Director for Art Center of the Bluegrass, and we are delighted to have you with us. Um, because we have people tuning in from sort of all over the place, uh, we are going to tell you just a little bit about uh, who the Art Center is. So we are a nonprofit visual arts organization located in Danville, Kentucky. We are smack in the heart of downtown Danville, which is a lovely community. So if you have never visited, you should plan a visit. Uh, the Art Center offers a range of programs for children and adults. We do curated rotating selection of exhibits, we have classes, we do special events that are art space, we have artists in residence that are able to have studios in our space, so we have all kinds of opportunities for the Art Center to be a creative hub, not just for Danville and Boyle County, but for the entire southern bluegrass region of Kentucky, and thanks to the wonders of Zoom, we are welcoming people from all over the country for programs like the one you're in today, so we are delighted that you are here. Um, I want to take just a minute to thank our sponsors. Um, Lunch with the Arts is a monthly program. We do usually the third Wednesday of most months. Uh, at noon, we invite an artist to share something about their work and their experience. And our season is sponsored by Stuart Powell, Ford Lincoln Mazda, and by Direct Experience in Artistic Living, which is a wonderful uh, foundation here in Danville that supports the arts. So we're delighted to have them as our sponsors for this entire season. And um, we are hoping that you will join us for the next program. So our next Lunch with the Arts program is in March. And we will be welcoming Michael Hughes with the Danville Boyle County African American Historical Society, telling us a bit about that wonderful organization, which has just recently opened a location and a storefront on 2nd Street here in Danville. So we're excited to hear how that organization is doing and their plans for the future. That program, as well as this program, are being offered in connection with our current winter show, which is the Art of Being Black, Conversation and Experience. We are delighted uh, to have this show up. It'll be up through April 17th, both in person and on our website. So if you can come into the building to see the artwork, please do. It is lovely. If you are not in our area or just not venturing out yet, we also have a fully curated online exhibit that you can explore as well that includes the art from the show. It includes um, video clips from some of the artists. And it's a really great way for you to engage with this fantastic exhibit that we have up right now. And our speaker for today, I'm going to turn it over to him in just a minute, is Frank X. Walker, whom I first knew as a poet, as a former poet laureate for the state of Kentucky. But through this exhibit, I've also had the pleasure of getting to know Frank as a visual artist. And you are in for a treat today because we get to sort of see a little bit of both sides of him. He's going to be sharing some of his poetry and also talking a bit about the work that he has in this current show. He's one of our featured artists in the current show, The Art of Being Black, Conversation and Experience, specifically in the Momentum exhibit of the show. And we are delighted to have him. I'm gonna unshare my screen and mute myself so that I can turn it over um, to Frank X. Walker. Danville, somebody passed me a Persian roll uh, from the bakery. It's always good to be home. It's, it's a little torturous to be this close to home and to not really be home. Um, but we're going to make it work. I'm going to um, visit you today as a poet. I'm going to reference uh, how my work interfaces with my visual art and hope that uh, by the time I bore you with my poetry, that you'll be interested in uh, logging on to the website uh, at the Art Center and checking out some of the, the work I have in the current, actually two different exhibits. I think there are a total of seven or eight pieces there. Um, most of them will have a direct relationship with what I'm gonna read today. You know, I tried to go through some past collections and I, what I'm gonna try to read for you today is a set of poems that intersect of, at race and sports. You know, some of them are um, 
may seem uh, more political than others. Some of them may seem like they're more closely tied to uh, the more stinging and biting pieces of visual art in the exhibit. And then others just may call up a, a fond or funny memory uh, connected with sports uh, in, in and around Danville and, and, and my personal life. Uh, what you may not know about me is that I'm a recovering athlete, uh, that in high school, I played football and ran track and made the basketball team, um, but also was elected class president, and my mother didn't think I could do both, so she made me choose between being the class officer and playing on the basketball team. Uh, I always kicked myself because I chose politics uh, and chose to be the class president for I think in 10th grade and then again in the 12th grade. Um, but I still play basketball on the side. Uh, I don't know if you can live in Danville or live in Titletown and not be impacted by sports. Uh, most certainly all the kids in my neighborhood participated in little league football or baseball um, as, a, as a player or a cheerleader. Uh, you know, when the Danville schools expanded uh, the athletic fields and built that gorgeous uh, soccer stadium and, and nicer baseball field uh, and the beautiful football stadium, it seemed to get even bigger. Uh, I know I still enjoy, or except for this past fall, coming back home on Friday nights uh, during football season to watch both Boyle County and, and Danville play since I have family in, in both school systems. So I'm gonna read a whole series of poems and talk a little bit and hopefully have it not feel like a lecture um, I think some of the stuff is, is more important than others. When you think about sports, um, most people tend to gravitate towards the, the celebrity in the sports. You know, right now the conversation is about Tiger Woods and his, his car wreck uh, yesterday. And you think about uh, the most significant Kentuckian who was also an athlete and a world ambassador and uh, activist, Muhammad Ali. Of, you know, he has such an iconic presence that he's known all over the world. Um, I recall being in Ireland uh, and walking down the street uh, on this row of pubs that kind of arched uphill. And a gentleman stumbled out of a pub and saw I had a shirt on that said Kentucky. And he pointed at my shirt, said Kentucky. And then he said, Muhammad Ali, as best as he could in his uh, inebriated state. And then stumbled on down the hill. And I, and I still laugh about how Ali is probably the most recognizable individual from the state. And he's an athlete. He's an African-American athlete. Um, I'm going to go backwards in time and, and talk about some athletes that you may or may not know about. Uh, and try to stay at that top end. You think about, if I was giving you a pop quiz and I asked you to name the first Black world champion uh, African-American in any sport. Uh, most of you probably failed that, that, that quiz. Um, the answer is George Dixon in 1890, and he was a bantamweight boxer. Um, he does, doesn't have Kentucky connections, but the one that does have Kentucky connections will be the one who won a world championship in 1899. Uh, his name is Major Taylor. And his Kentucky connections are... Uh, a little nebulous because he was born in Indianapolis, but his parents are both from Kentucky. They moved to Indianapolis and gave birth to him. And he became the first African-American man to, um, to win a world championship on a bicycle. He still holds seven world records, but he won the one mile race on a bicycle. And I only mention him because he appears in a poem I'm gonna read uh, about my father and bicycles. You know, my father, uh, for many years, rode his bicycle around town. And it wasn't a bicycle you could buy right out of the shop that's, you know, I mean, looks like a sleek Cadillac or Corvette. My father's bike was assembled from spare parts from other bicycles. Uh, it had a huge seat on it because it was comfortable, but the seat came off of a, I think, a, some kind of other elliptical machine. Um, and the handlebars were not made for the bike. They were these giant, you know, almost uh, motorcycle handlebars. 
but he loved that bike and he rode around town and some, and people used to laugh at him because he looked a little crazy on the bicycle. And for, you know, the other two English majors out there, uh, it made me immediately think about Don Quixote uh, on his steed and fighting a, a windmill uh, in literature. So this is called Don Quixote Races Major Taylor. It's a tribute to my father, Frank Walker Sr. Watching my father coasting downhill on his tired horse, a hand-painted cruiser with big, ugly handlebars and a comfortable seat, oblivious to the laughs and cat calls cast from behind screen doors and shaded porches. I remember streets crowded with bicycles in Havana and Santiago, Cuba. I recall the glistening calves of old men and women, their lean, muscular frames hardened by a life of struggle and pedaling uphill. Then I imagine Major Taylor's father, a humble coachman, leaving Kentucky for post-Civil War Indiana, proud and tall in his waistcoat, white gloves, and top hat, and wonder what he whispered in his son's ear to transform the indignity of epithets and stares, performing bicycle tricks, dressed like a Civil War officer. Who knows what his mother rubbed onto his thick in skin to be leather enough to trade his uniform for biking tights, still enough to find his own horsepower and sprint faster than any carriage driver ever dared. To ride so fast, the hateful words windmilled off his back until they sounded like whirlwind, champion, and applause. When I ride, shining with Taylor and daddy's legacies tattooed in sweat across my brow, I'm reminded that I am crazy crazy for doubting, crazy for hesitating, crazy for forgetting that the first world champion Black American ever produced rode a bicycle across the finish line. And that's a fairly old poem uh, from Ink Stains and, uh, and Watermarks from a number of years ago. So I'm trying to move chronologically uh, through time as I talk about sports and, and race. So I'm going to read a handful of poems from Isaac Murphy. I dedicate this ride. Uh, some of you have studied this in your classrooms and some of you uh, were part of a Everybody Reads program that Center College hosted when this book first came out and we gave away hundreds of copies uh, and did several readings around town. But when you think about jockeys, a lot of people don't think about jockeys as athletes, but maybe because they seem too small uh, but they're the same size as gymnasts. Uh, but they're maneuvering the equivalent of an automobile. I mean, a 2,000 pound, uh, a 1,000 pound animal around the track with their arms and legs uh, and steering with their knees in some cases, and, you know, really strong wrists and hands. So they, are, they have to be athletes to pull this off. So I'm going to read a handful of poems from this in different voices uh, connected to Isaac Murphy's life. And it may not be as holistic a narrative as I would normally give you if I were read straight from Isaac Murphy to give you Isaac's story, but I'm just trying to give you Isaac's story in as much as it intersects with race, sports, and in this case, the classroom, because the work I have um, in the Momentum exhibit uh, intersects in those spaces, the classroom, uh, race and sports. So this first one is in the voice of Isaac Murphy's teacher, a man whose name is Eli Jordan. And the poem is called Uncle Eli's Rules. Eli Jordan speaking. Learn your numbers and always do the math. Don't Ride a horse you don't know yet. Don't ride a horse that don't know you neither. Don't race a horse you ain't rode. Don't forget it's a race and not no parade. Only ask the horse for what you need to win. The horse gotta run like it got blinders on. You don't. Set the pace on the track after you set it in your heart. Leave your fears at the starting line. If you must be afraid, be afraid of losing. So that's Uncle Eli teaching Isaac 
this next poem is in the voice of Isaac, describing what it's like to, to be in Uncle Eli's class and what he learned and how he learned it. And understand that his teacher, Eli Jordan, is not coming out of a traditional classroom experience. Everything he knows, he learned uh, in the barn on a, on a racetrack. Um, so he teaches in that same manner. This poem is called Science Class for Jockeys. Ozzy Murphy speaking. Uncle Eli returns from the barrel we keep outside the barn and says, this is a horse's breath, then sets down two full buckets of rainwater. He says, this is a horse's heart and squeezes a little water out of a big wet sponge he pulls out of a bucket. Then he wraps a short rope around his fist real tight and says, this is all the power they legs can hold. He says, my job is to manage the heart and legs and lungs to get to the end with just enough rope and water to make it across the finish line. He says, this is the secret to winning a horse race. He says it ain't no magic or luck, it's science. And he calls his science pacing. So I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, <clears throat> to a poem that, that tries to illustrate uh, what I imagine the relationship between Isaac Murphy and his mother was who, who had to give him enough or give him the talk way before we called it the talk uh, to teach him how to not just be successful, but to also stay alive in the space that he had no power in, uh, even though he was a celebrated athlete. And uh, he was praised not just for his athleticism, but for his high character and moral standing. Uh, the newspaper articles, you know, from the 1800s describe him halfway through the article, uh, always referring to his, his, his athletic prowess and his success on the track. And then immediately they switch to talking about <clears throat> what kind of man he was. So this is, <clears throat> Poem called, Come Sunday, It's Derby, and the voice of his mother, America Burns. He might not ever tell it to the papers, but I'm the first person Isaac ever see ride. I'm the first person he watched get up at dawn, fill a tub with scalding water, soap, and dirty clothes, lock everything between my knees, bend over and grab something by his ears, race it up and down the washboard till I baptize the dirt right out. Everybody ride the hell out of something. I seen a good preacher ride a church full of people with his words alone, have us all talking back to him while he trotters along and teach straight from the word of God. Then once he work up a rhythm, some of us gets on our feet and urge him on like our amens is whips and our go ahead on preachers is spurs. Directly, he turn a corner and leave the page and when his tongue starts to gallop, he ride all the way to the end of the sermon till the whole church is soaked straight through with sweat, more exhausted than any horse and rider I've ever seen. And I'm gonna skip towards the end because the challenge that, that Isaac had was, he was living in a time period where uh, it was difficult to be a, a black man in society. And part of his challenge is he was also rich. Uh, so an additional challenge of class uh, was, something that he had to carry around with him. So this is a poem that speaks a little bit to that. It's called Negritude Test. And I try to speak to the classes of Isaac Murphy speaking. Mama's generation wrestled with that bear that was slavery and still carries the scars. Our fight is with poverty, a beast almost as vicious. I've been so successful at defeating my bear, many question my blackness. Accuse me of believing I am white or aspire to wake up so. But if the prerequisite for owning instead of renting, wearing suits instead of rags, eating ham instead of scraps, and enjoying champagne over pot liquor is being white, then I'm as Irish as they come. So that's an Irish, Isaac's voice. Um, maybe one more from this section, because his life was pretty difficult. He died at 35 years old, having been ridden out of racing. Um, 
I'll close with a poem called The Color of Racing from this collection. And his teacher's um, voice. The Color of Racing, Eli Jordan. When they say black jockeys dried up because they started to get too big, I say hogwash. Even before the argument between the blue and gray, most all horse people, except when they come to owning, looked like me. And why wouldn't they? It was hard, dangerous, thankless work. It's still hard, but at least after the war, we could hire our services out to the highest bidder. Half of Lexington was colored, and when we started coming to the races with our loud, proud, free selves, they started adding special seating and boxes so that the rich white folks that didn't have to rub elbows, the same people they used to own, the same folks who still cooked their food, washed their clothes and floors, and washed over their babies. Between not hiring blacks, made up suspensions and accidents that left many black riders crippled or dead, I believe somebody in the back room made a plan to keep all the green, to make horse racing a whites only sport. So they forced us out of the business one by one. The first Kentucky Derby had 13 black riders. A generation later, you could hardly find one. So I think, you know, that kind of covers what I wanted to say um, about sports and race and Kentucky using uh, Isaac Murphy. So I'm gonna jump forward to, to now, to what's happening today in the last five or 10 years anyway, uh, and read from some other collections in these same format. Uh, my very first book in 2000 um, has a poem that at one point had been on the 11th grade uh, test uh, in Kentucky schools. Um, some people were angry at me because of the whole exam as if I wrote more than the poem, but um, just the poem. I think they, they, they did, did away with the exam, uh, so it's no longer required. But this is called Death by Basketball, and it tries to talk about um, the materialism that has slowly seeped into to professional sports and sports in general because of the the really aggressive work that corporations like Nike and Adidas uh, and others have done, uh, you know, to, to commercialize everything. Death by basketball. Before and after school, he stood on a milk crate, eyeballed the mirror and only saw Wayne Turner at tournament time. A third grader, just off the bus, barely four feet off the ground, he dropped his books, sank a J from the top of the key and heard the crowd roar, beat his man off the dribble with a break your neck crossover and slammed himself on the cover of a box of Wheaties. He was out there every night under a street light, fighting through double picks, talking trash to imaginary body checks. You can't hold me, fool, fake right. This is my planet, drive left. Is the camera on? Reverse layup, that's butter, baby. Finishing with a tray from downtown. Swish, I'm in the zone tonight. Who got next? More than a little light in the ass. Hand so small, the ball almost dribbled him. He formed his own layup line in the bluegrass. Wildcat jersey hanging like a summer dress on a court made ball from daily use. And instead of writing his spelling words, he signed a contract he could barely read. Ink the commitment in big block letters to the NBA and Nike and Sprite. Scribble superstar in cursive with a fat red pencil and practice his million dollar smile, not his multiplication table. Thinking of how many chocolate milks he could buy with his all-star game appearance fee after recess. Another shooting, another tragic death, another little genius who would never test out of a dream that kills legitimate futures every night under street lights, wherever these products are sold. And I remember when I wrote that poem, uh, I was responding to this rash of muggings that were happening around the country uh, of young people by other young people. They were mugging them because they wanted their shoes. So Air Jordans became so highly valued, people were getting beat up for the shoes. And it just seemed ridiculous to me that they had so much value, that they were more valuable than somebody's life. 
Um, and so that was 21 years ago, that poem uh, is written and still I think applies today. Um, I've continued to make observations and comments, uh, some of them personal, uh, some, some from memories and some uh, about larger ideas in sports. Uh, I'll give you two examples from uh, Black Box. I go to, well, I went to UK, I now teach at UK, uh, but something happened in 1966 that kind of changed the face of, of sports or at least basketball uh, in the South. Kentucky lost to an all black uh, starting five Texas Western on television and the radio. Um, my father remembers the game fondly and he talked about listening to it on the radio with his best friend. Kentucky versus Texas Western, 1966. On our side of the tracks, that game casts a shadow as luminous as Joe Lewis's gloves, raised upright like corn stalks, like rockets, like Jesse Owens on the gold medal stand in Berlin. I see Daddy and Flick, a skinny would-be point guard, and even skinnier could have been forward, ace boons from way back, closer than brothers since they could pee straight, skip school, balance filter cigarettes like fireflies in alleys and parking lots like traveling magicians at a two-penny carnival. I see them huddled around a smoldering potbelly stove of a radio, still salty from frayed leather prayers launched toward the crooked rim on the side of the tobacco barn, hearts pumping, muscles ready and loose. They saddle themselves aboard every broadcasted syllable like neon jockeys as much a part of the audience as every ticket holder in the arena, as much to lose as the five black faces on the floor and more than anybody on the bench. A two-headed pep band, flat-chested cheerleaders, unable to sit, they slap palms and knuckle up their black hand sides, waging the value of the manhood on the final score. Like so many more black and country boys and men, whose only connection to the pages in my history books floated on AM dials and radio waves, rare television footage that imported two-dimensional black and white and flaming images of Birmingham, DC and Watts into our quiet country towns in middle America, Danvilles, Harrisburgs, parable battlefields reveling in segregated comfort zones propped up by traditions as rigid as back doors and rebel flags. It was not just a game rebound. It was evidence that the uncivil war passed. Not only could be one dribble, but they, though young, country, and black, shoot, were not alone. Swish. So you probably heard the references to, to horse racing in there, uh, to jockeys. Um, that comes up a lot in these Kentucky-centric uh, collections. This next one is actually a memory from being a high school football player uh, and having the challenge of not laughing at what I thought was really a funny moment, but because of where I was in proximity to my coach, uh, who was a minister who preached to us at halftime, uh, if we were losing, this event happened. So I'll just read it. It's called Jesuit for the Danville Admirals. Coach had a hard time convincing me that someone on the other team had done something so horrendous, I was supposed to strap on my chin strap, wade into the thick of battle intent on doing bodily harm. Best I could do was wait until somebody rang my bell, threw a chop block or caught me off guard with a cheap shot. Then my violence was simply a matter of self-defense. Mama's turn the other cheek philosophy didn't go over well with Coach Swain. And he was a Bible scholar too, always ranting about David and Goliath and what Joshua did to Jericho. If he needed a fire and brimstone at halftime, he'd wade through the valley of our hung heads, conjure up the image of Moses and the powerful Red Sea smiting old Pharaoh's army. Then he'd get in everyone's face yelling and spitting, sometimes losing his partial plate in the process. As soon as we returned to the field, I'd catch a glimpse of the smooth-legged Delilahs and short skirts and pom-poms, close my eyes, and try to find the Samson in me. So that's football and me in high school. Uh, you also heard uh, the biblical references that 
if you know my personal history, you know, my mother was a Pentecostal minister for 22 years and her teaching and upbringing in that house, uh, you know, was profound. Um, I'm going to read from a little chat book because uh, I think this poem is not in a book yet. It's called Big Money Grip. And, you know, it makes, uh, tries to make a contemporary uh, comment on what's happening with sports. Uh, and you find real quickly that, you know, I think uh, black athletes are exploited, especially at the college level. Um, and the coaches make $10 million a year. The schools make even more. Um, and sometimes the student athletes get an education and sometimes they get a degree. This is called Big Money Grip. In the dirty, dirty Southeastern Conference, where the Mississippi is all blood, sweat, and fears of losing, mostly white men reach middle age, admiring magnolias for mansions, having reaped millions to fuel antique sugar, cotton, and citrus bowls with drunken frat boys and southern bells and cowboy boots, while assistant see your overs whip mostly poor black bodies into shape to harvest news clips and win sponsorships from sun up to sundown towns. They run the draft pick and row after row after row, gather and fill stat sheets like burlap sacks in fields of suffocating heat or while hanging from rims and tims and limbs and early morning shoot around running suicides before serving time in the wait and wait and wait room. Then suddenly are labeled ungrateful runaway bucks for accepting a steak dinner, a pair of shoes, a flight home for Christmas, a rent for mama, from carpet bagging agents on the underground, under the table railroad, running from high school gym floors to the final four, to their family's financial freedom. So hopefully you heard all the historical reference that dealt with uh, Underground Railroad, enslavement, picking cotton, um, that I use as metaphors to move that, that poem along. Um, there's a um, poem I want, wanted to read from the Mega Evers book that I, it just occurred to me that has a connection um, that does the same kind of thing um, as far as points at sports and its, its, um, its connection to race and how exploitation happens. In this particular poem I'm gonna read, you know, if you can imagine being at a high school bonfire uh, or pep rally and all that anger and passion that gets stirred up um, to make you root against the other team, subtract sports from the equation and imagine that the gathering is actually a public lynching. I'll stop there. Southern sports. This is in the voice of Byron de Beckwith, the assassin who killed Mega Evers. Sometimes it starts with a bonfire or begins with taunting and spitting quickly graduating to cursing and punching and kicking some body as hard as you can for the sheer joy of causing them pain, as entertainment for the crowd now celebrating the crack or pop of broken bodies, showering outstanding individual violence with applause and cheers. All you need is some body wearing the color you've been taught to hate, some body threaten to take what's rightfully yours. And a little girl with her thighs exposed, held high in the air and screaming. So hopefully you can, you can hear uh, the illusions drawn between uh, a lynch mob and a, a crowd at a football game and that passion and anger that gets boiled up to the surface uh, around sports and how those individuals can, can let the guy out of hand. Um, I'll close with a series of poems that come from my latest book called Masked Man Black. And these deal directly with the pandemic uh, and the protests in the country in the last year. Um, and since they come, take the time here, about 10 minutes. Uh, I read about six or seven of these. 
and try to find the ones that are more uncomfortable for, for people to hear. Um, if that's possible, I think they're all about the same degree of, of discomfort. This is a poem where I imagine what was going to happen uh, right after they decided to cancel last year's Final Four and then start canceling everything. Um, I wrote this poem called The End of Sporting. No balls, no teams, no uniforms, just shirts and skins, just beautiful black bodies in slow motion, because that's why you watch, admit it. A soundtrack of choreographed, almost breathless heartbeats, 3D, 5G cameras that zoom in and out, accent lights and shadows, judges that pontificate about the sweat, the musculature, the sanguinicity of each flight, broadcast live on pay-per-view, sell season subscriptions, but don't call it something blithe like comply or obey. Be honest, tell the truth, call it stop or I'll. And by stop, you will mean don't blink, don't be black or brown, don't even breathe. But you won't even have to say the N word out loud. There's a, another poem and the deals directly with, with uh, directly with sports of but not at the same time it's part of how we survived the pandemic last year when it first happened being trapped at home um, we started feeding birds we had I guess we have now three plus uh, bird feeders and we also leased it on the ground because there's so many birds that come to the neighborhood, um, still can't feed them all. But this is called season ticket holders. And it also comes out of me missing sports on television. Season ticket holders. Before the pandemic, feeding the birds was little more than a chore. I appreciated their beauty from my window and I noticed how quickly the bird seed disappeared. Now, filling the feeder is part of a morning ritual with our two-year-old. We've got floor seats to the daily races between the pair of cardinals, blue jays, doves, and a red-headed woodpecker. At the opposite end of the court are the pickup games between the athletic sparrows and the neighborhood's feral felines. It feels a little strange because for the first time in a long time, I'm not rooting for the cats. I do miss my comfortable chair, ESPN, game day, and a cold beer, but what I'm modeling for my son has made me a less unruly fan and a much better father. So you can hear the sports in there. Um, here's another one called Citius Altius Fortius AC. And that's the Latin I remember from high school. Um, and it just means, um, faster, higher, stronger. It's the model that you find uh, connected to the Olympic logo. Citius Altius Fortius, AC. Is this the future? Football stadiums with no fans, basketball arenas and empty seats. Where is our imagination? Where is our vision? Install a camera in every seat. Offer that point of view to ticket holders, family members, and the press. No more nosebleed sections where the patrons watch the big screen instead of the field. No more privileged sideline and half court seats exclusively for money and power. Instead of ticket scalping, encourage pay what you can. Transform seats into real time images of every player's loved ones and friends. Make the NCAA pay for it. No more athletic prowess sacrificed for the pleasure of strangers. Let the competition not be reduced to gladiators risking death for their own freedom, for mere spectacle at the pleasure of owners, athletic directors, and VIPs. Let it be something more, something truly laudable and unattainable, something that brings back the spirit of the game, for the love of the game, something that highlights the honor in victory and defeat. We can run faster, we can reach higher, we can be stronger. So let us. Uh, 
All right. Uh, I think I have time for two more before we take Q&A. Um, which two will it be? I want to read two poems. I think this would be a good balance uh, that are tributes to, to young people. Um, if I can find the page. All right, can't find the one I was looking for. So here's another sports related one uh, that deals with, if you can recall the, the outcry after the George Floyd incident last May, um, imagine that as, as a sports event uh, and listen to this coverage. Offensive captain, they had become so arrogant they didn't even change the playbook. We knew they would try to convince us we couldn't trust the video with our own eyes, minds, or hearts. When the officer called the play of the huddle, he didn't care that the cameras were on. Black 27, stop resisting. Afraid for my life, we will call it self-defense till he can't breathe. On three, break. When he adjusted his knee and caught an audible, he believed his offensive guards who were compressing the lungs were hidden behind the line of scrimmage, as if we'd never seen a fake up the middle, strong right quarter cop sneak. The sobbing, grief-stricken, collapsing black matron on the jumbo trying in the end zone feels like paid advertisement on a loop. The chili does a chanting, all lives matter, and he, he should have obeyed, he should have obeyed in between the deafening roar of go, big, blue. The first autopsy suggested hypertension killed the play and not the eight minute and 46 seconds while the cop took a knee. We must change the game. We must change it now. What have we got to lose? All right, that may be a good place to stop. Um, so I will. And we we'll figure out, Kate, how to take uh, questions. Um, I guess yeah. you can do the chat. Yeah, I think the easiest thing might be for people to put it in chat rather than trying to unmute themselves, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions. And thank you so much. That was fantastic. Yeah, if anybody has a question, you can throw it into the chat. If not, we'll uh, pepper you with some of our own. <laughs> Maybe while people collect their thoughts, will you... Will you talk for just a little bit about what you see as the relationship between written word and visual art? I know you could talk about that for hours, but just bridge, bridge us to the exhibit for just a minute and how you see some of your art as an extension of some of what you've written about. Well, I think my challenge is, you know, trying to be an artist in multiple disciplines and, and not believing that I can't be more than one kind of artist in the same space. So a lot of the work that I've shared has writing, has text, has words uh, that kind of dominate the surface of the visual art versus just something that is colorful or intended to be beautiful or to, intended to recreate a scene. Uh, I'm trying to recreate an emotion. Uh, I'm trying to recreate a memory for people. Um, so th thus that's my focus. You know, there are two pieces in the exhibit that are simulated chalkboards. And what you see is the punishment of a young girl and a young boy of color who've been sent to the board as punishment to write something over and over again, you know, like a hundred times as punishment. Um, and to me, what it tries to illustrate is this extension of how uh, black bodies, young black bodies in classrooms have been policed. You know, how um, young women have been viewed as over and hypersexualized, how young men have been seen as athletes, simply athletes. Um, you know, and it, that's a personal space for me. I, I recall being in high school and I was in my, I think it's my trigonometry class. Uh, and the teacher had asked everyone to say what they were doing after college. And we went around the room alphabetically, uh, after high school, after graduation, and everybody was going to a different college. When it got to me uh, in the W's, I said I was going to University of Kentucky to study engineering. 
And she laughed and said out loud, what, you mean you're not gonna play basketball like the rest of them? And I just remember how much that hurt in that moment. And the thing, you know, this was an adult and I was still technically still a kid. Uh, and whatever she felt or thought, it just popped out of her mouth. And maybe she didn't know how much it would hurt or maybe uh, she didn't care that it showed how much it hurt. But in that moment, I could feel kind of a separation between me and the rest of my classroom, you know, who were, I think, except for Cheryl Rowe, uh, who's African-American woman, uh, young woman, everyone else was white, like most of my classes. You know, I had been separated very early coming into high school because they had tracking back then. Um, and after homeroom or leaving this bus in the morning, I might not see my own siblings or relatives or, or neighborhood until the end of the day. Uh, and it was a kind of strange experience to be separated, you know, from my peers um, and tracked on this uh, preparatory college curriculum. Uh, I often wonder why it was just me and Cheryl, you know, there were, uh, when it came to something about academics, you know, we were very underrepresented. When it was sports, it was the exact opposite. We were overrepresented. So there was this imbalance happening and nobody talked about it. Uh, so some of the art I make reaches back to my own personal experience. I'm also trying to reach out to the larger experience of, of other people, other generations who experienced it in a different way, uh, which is probably the part of the reason, you know, I like talking about subjects and reaching backwards as far as possible. You know, we start today with 1890, then 1899, then 1960s, and then today. Uh, how in spite of those years and those jumps, we're still talking about the same stuff. It really hasn't changed that much. The racial dynamics are so intense um, that when you illustrate them and talk about them, people can see the connections. And I think it's only by looking at the past and studying it uh, intently that we can learn something about how to fix things as we move forward. You know, that's my ultimate hope that these tools, uh, this combination of textual and visual, um, you know, images, you know, help people have a conversation and the conversation leads to some healing or uh, some intellectual growth and development, or maybe even some change in some of, uh, some of how we do things. You know, even, you know, I hate the idea that people can get away with saying, well, we've always done it that way and that's enough of a reason to keep doing it. Uh, but I think we have to look at everything we've done, even in education, even in our curriculum, our classroom, even the books we've used for 10, 12 years. Um, you know, are these the right books uh, for today, for these kids? You know, will it prepare them for tomorrow? You know, some big questions obviously, uh, but I could talk forever about any of those subjects. I'm gonna stop, cut myself off. No, that, that's great. We've got a question pop up in the chat. It says, where do you find your hope in today's time for solutions or progress? Young people. I think that one of the advantages uh, of teaching is that as long as the students are younger than you, um, they can give you hope. You know, if you believe in them, if you care about their development, as you watch them grow, because you can see hope actualized uh, when you have a student for the entire year, you have them more than once, uh, you can see that growth and development. And when I think about the most recent social protests, you know, around this racial reckoning in the United States and how it was led by young people, even younger than, um, than the civil rights movement, you know, the front line of this movement is almost a generation younger. Uh, it's more diverse, uh, it's more global, uh, these kids have more knowledge, they have more technology, and they've created what I consider a brand new movement uh, that hopefully will have even a larger impact uh, than the civil rights era had in America. And it's, it's, it feels good to, to witness it, uh, to support it, and acknowledge that it's not my movement. You know, I'm at almost 60 years old now. Uh, I can't imagine myself on the front line of any of these events last summer, but I'm grateful to have grandchildren uh, that you know, are emotionally invested in, in that space. And they just use me as a reference point. That's great, thank you. Um, I've got an another question from the chat wondering, did you go on to study engineering? And if so, like, how did you move into the arts? Well, to be honest, I should have never 
have been studying engineering. Um, I was on the math and science track. You know, I was gonna be a scientist or a doctor or something in that field, make a lot of money. Uh, my mother chose my major. Uh, the recruiter from UK came to our house. I was in my room one Saturday morning and I heard him talk to my mother and I heard him say, you know, when he graduates with a degree in engineering, he'll start out with $60,000 a year. And my mother said, sign him up. Then she came to my room and said, get dressed. You're going to UK to take a tour with, with this man. And so I meet him for the first time and on the way to UK, he tells me about the scholarship I won in engineering. Uh, I didn't know anything about electrical engineering. I thought that meant you just plug stuff up. Um, when I got to UK, the it was such a a horrible first semester for me. Of, you know, because of sports, and then an accident. I was in the emergency room three times in one month. Uh, playing basketball, I had 17 stitches in, in my across my eyebrow. Um, I got teeth knocked out of my mouth, had to be wired back in uh, playing flag football. Uh, and I was jumping up to close the window in the laundry room and busted the window and it cut across my wrist and I had 27 stitches. And I ended up missing a whole month of classes. But because I was a first generation kid, I didn't know to go to the teacher and get the homework, get it organized. But I was on painkillers for a month. I barely got out of bed. I lost about 12 pounds. Uh, it, but there, was, there wasn't anybody there for me to get me through that experience. So it made it a rough first year. So I thought, you know, I'm not cut out for school. <laughs> college is too rough, it's too dangerous. At the end of that first year, I decided to quit college and I got a job back in Danville loading trucks uh, in the Tommy Can factory that used to be there. At the end of the summer, I was like, I'm not cut out for loading trucks. And my mother convinced me to go back to school, but our agreement was I could change my major. So I changed my major to journalism with a graphic art sequence because it had the two things I loved. I'd won awards for art and for English in high school. And that's where I wanted to, to apply, my, apply myself. But everybody said I would starve as a writer or an artist. So I, I accepted their intelligence and, and, and knowledge and, and didn't pursue those things initially. Uh, but eventually I found my way through from journalism to creative writing to English and minoring in art. And, when I realized that I could make my own choices. You know, I was an adult now. Uh, I was paying my own bills. <laughs> so once I changed that, that, you know, once I got to the point where I realized that's part of growing up is, um, you know, respecting your parents, but also realizing that you have to make your own decisions based on who you are and what you need based on the gifts that you've been given and what you're passionate about. And I, you know, somebody had asked me, at 17 years of what I wanted to study, I would have said, you know, art and, and, and writing. Um, but nobody asked me. In fact, my counselor told me I should go to the army. Um, in spite of my performance on standardized testing, uh, which were pretty good, you know. I was a really good student, but I think I got poor advice from adults in that, that space. Short answer. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Oh, just a follow up asking about if your family remained in Danville. You said you grew up here. If? Yeah, did, did, your, did your family remain in Danville? Most of my family is still in Danville. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of 10 or 11 kids, depending on what mood I'm in. Um, most of whom have kids of their own. And one of the things that has motivated me to come back to Danville every year since I've graduated is knowing that in some of those classrooms, somebody's gonna say, you know, uh, you're my daddy's cousin or you're my Uncle Frank or, uh, I mean, it's always beautiful to, to see them in the classroom and see them beam and, and be proud of the fact that their relative is back home in the classroom as a guest. Uh, and that's happened for me you know, um, now we have the maybe seventh or eighth annual Frank X. Walker Literary Festival that happens out of the high school and Mr. Atkins' organizational skills. Um, but I never left Danville to that degree. You know, I'm very proud of my relationship. Every bio I've ever produced 
and been introduced anywhere, no matter what country. They always say I'm from Danville, Kentucky. Uh, and that feels good and it means something to me. Um, and it's interesting that only this year or I guess the end of last year that I exhibit visual art. Most people in Danville don't know that I was a visual artist unless you've known me for 40 years uh, because you haven't seen it because I haven't been making a lot. Uh, but in the, since my father passed, uh, I've been creating a lot more visual art. I'm actually sitting in the art studio right now. You just can't see it. It's a, books behind me, but everywhere else is dedicated to visual art. All right, we got time for one more quick one, and I love this. Somebody asks, what are you reading right now? What's next in your book stack? I'm reading the most amazing book by Ross Gay. It's a long poem, book-length poem, about Dr. J, uh, one of my personal heroes, uh, Julius Irving, the basketball player who could, like, leave the, the ground on one side of the backboard and float underneath and shoot from the other side. I mean, there's so much video of his amazing feats way old before Michael Jordan and these other young guns that are doing it now. Um, it's nice to make that circular path back to sports and race. So Ross Gay, uh, it's called Be Holden, and I'm loving it. Book of the poem on Dr. J. Perfect. Well, on that note, I think we will wrap up. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us. Thank you to you for sharing your words and ideas. It's always wonderful to have a conversation with you. And for everybody who's tuned in, please do um, come see the exhibit at Art Center of the Bluegrass. It's on display through April 17th. You can also access it on our website, artcenterky.org. The show is titled The Art of Being Black, Conversation and Experience. And Frank X. Walker is one of our featured artists. There are a number of wonderful, talented artists in the show. And we would love for you to be able to see that work. And join us next month for the African-American Historical Society of Danville, Boyle County. You can register on their website the same way you did for this, um, this program. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dorian. We'll see you out there.